Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. All right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and stand uh, and let's sing some of these songs. We're going to sing "Behold Our God," and and as we're singing that, let's ju- let's not just sing it. You know, like oh, let's I know the song, so I'm just going to sing it. Let's actually behold our God, right? Let's think about how amazing He is, how He loved us so much to send His Son to die for us. Uh, and that's an am- amazing thing that we can worship him for. And so the, the words of the song really uh, magnify that. And so l- I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll begin to sing. Father God, we thank you that we can come here and worship you, God. Thank you uh, that you are the ultimate father in our life. God, we thank you that uh, no matter what we go through, God, that you are there with us. Lord, I pray that this time will just be honoring and glorifying to you. Help us to worship you in, in, in spirit and in truth. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, 
Hey, you can go ahead and be seated, but grab your bulletin. Hey, we are glad you're worshiping with us here, especially on Father's Day, but you know, those of us who've come to faith in Christ know we have the greatest Father that the world has ever known, who gave his son as a ransom for each one of us, and we're excited about the fact that you've come to worship with us. Take a note of your bulletin. We want to remind you that immediately following the service today, we're going to be giving out root beer to all the dads, and even if you're not a dad, if you're a guy here today, we want you to have a dad's root beer on us, so be sure to grab that. We also have a um, luncheon today, immediately following. There's plenty of food, so if you don't have any plans, be sure to stay with us for that as well. Take a look at upcoming events, if you will, in your bulletin. First of all, on Monday, Wednesday through the 28th through the uh, 30th is our vacation Bible school from 5 to 7. We're really excited about the theme in Egypt and Joseph this year. And a lot of people have signed up and are going to be involved in that. To continue to be praying, and if you would still yet want to work in that, be sure to let Andrea know about that. There's a baby shower for Christina Grafner coming up Saturday, July 17th. So want to remember that, ladies. Also note the summer office hours. They are changing for the summer. That's just because I'm going to be having some surgery, and so there's no point in having somebody there 24-7 <laughs> in our office, so we're cutting back on that. Would you take a note at the back, because there's some exciting series that are coming up. I want you to be aware of it. Uh, next Sunday, we're having a one-message series on having our minds stayed upon Jesus. We're going to be looking at three principles, two exchanges, and three stages. That talks about that. Also, we're going to have our freedom service on the 4th of July. No Discovery Hour classes. Our, our theme will be freedom. We're going to be around the communion service that day. So come and worship with us. Patriotic Christian music put together on that service. And then Pastor Derek is going to begin his series on 1 Peter. So that's going to be an exciting time together as well. It's my privilege.
pray here in a minute, but just to follow up on that, what he's saying. So Kath and I have had a chance to They're having a dream or a vision. My wife was sitting at a, a, a place where we were staying, just reading her Bible, and this young man comes up, asks her, are you Christian? She didn't know how to answer, but she decided she would. The night before, he had had a dream that he had come to Christ, and he wanted to find somebody that had a Bible. And we saw an opportunity for him to really come to the Lord. So this is happening around the world, what he's saying. Hey, if you want to meet more and talk more with Bob about this whole thing, uh, that's what the luncheon's all about. And uh, thanks, Bob, for being here today. Let's bow together. Father, we've just sung about beholding our God. It's an amazing thing. For we don't think like you do. Our ways aren't your ways. But you draw us to yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, through the ministry and drawing of the Holy Spirit, where we can come into a relationship with you. And we're so grateful for that. As we continue to worship, and as Derek comes and finishes up our book on this great handoff in, in 2 Timothy, that, Lord, you just go before us and encourage us and strengthen our hand and continue to pray for those who are willing to go where the church does not exist and have a ministry. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together to continue to worship.
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. You were the Word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory and creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful send your son to die for us, and that through Jesus' sacrifice, we can now obtain salvation by your grace. Father, I pray now as we hear your word and as we learn the truth through it, that you will just speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, just speak to us, reveal to us who Jesus is today. That's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
There we go. Today, let's see, what was it last? Two Sundays ago. Remember two Sundays ago when we uh, were missing a few people uh, to help with the worship team? And I was like, ah, we're a little shorthanded today. Well, we had backups, right? Well, today, we didn't even have backups. <laughs> so the backups to the backups were even a little bit busy. So we, uh, you know, I want to thank Marv. Marv is back there. And uh, I mean, he hasn't done this in a really long time. And so I'm so glad that he was willing and able to do this. Um, we thank you for the, for the missionary here and, and the things that he had shared. And, um, but yeah, it's been a little chaotic this morning. And so I'm trying to just gather my thoughts. You know, usually I'm back there right before I come out and I'm able to kind of prepare myself. This remote I left up here is going to kind of bother me. So, um, but yeah, we, we are at the end of First Timothy. Sorry, Second Timothy. <laughs> uh, we finally made it. That's how I'm going to be at the end of this day, to be honest. I finally made it. Um, but I, I am very excited about this last sermon. Uh, not because I'm preaching it, but because the truth that God has in his word. Uh, and it's a really cool thing. And as I was studying this, I was just very excited about sharing it. Um, and this, this whole series, this whole book, I've, I've really enjoyed. And, and you know, I, I hope that you have felt the same way. I hope that it's impacted your life as, as much as it has impacted mine. Uh, because God has really spoken to me through this, and, and so I really appreciate it, uh, this, this letter that Paul has written that God has given us. And remember, the theme through this whole thing is about the charge of the gospel to the next generation, right? It's the great hand off. See, what we're doing at this point is we're handing off the baton, and I mentioned that last week, right? What, how this looks is preaching the word, this handoff, right? We can... We can uh, guard it, we can train for it, we can, we can suffer through it, we can do all these things, and it's finally here, the great handoff. Last week, what we, talk, what we looked at was this charge that Paul had given us, and ultimately that God has given us as Christians. This charge is to preach the word. We are guarding and suffering for it, we're continuing and living through it. Now it is time for us to proclaim it. And so that's where we are. We, we always need to be ready. And this is what we talked about last week, right? We always need to be ready to preach the word, not just when it's convenient, not when it's easy for us, not when we're the most well-prepared for something. Sometimes you might be in a situation where you don't feel prepared, but then that's when God can use you the most. We also saw that the word needs to be used for correction, rebuke, and encouragement. And we need to have a blend of all three of those. Right? We can't just be correcting nonstop and rebuking nonstop, and we definitely can't just be encouraging, right? We need to have a blend of all three of those things and use the word for all of them. And when we're preaching the word, we must also show patience and understand that God isn't on our schedule. We are on God's schedule. And, and spiritual growth and spiritual maturity may not happen as fast as we want it to. God is in control of that. God is the one that produces the results. And so that's what we had looked at last week. We had, we, had a, we had a few questions, right? Who, how, you know, all these different things. Well, today is, is, is kind of the last question that we have for Preach the Word. And the next question Paul has is, or that we will have, is why? And Paul has the answer. Why is this charge given? Why have we been given this? Father God, thank you for this word. I pray that you will just speak to us now. Speak through me. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the first thing is, why are we given this charge? Why, right? There, there's got to be a reason. Paul's saying these things. Why, why does this even need to be said? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 3, we read, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So we are given this charge first because there will be a day when people will not want to listen to the teaching of the word. There will be a day when people just don't want to listen to the truth. So I, uh, I don't know how many of you know, I think it's on Daystar, I can't remember exactly what channel it's on, but uh, there's Pensacola Christian College, the church. Uh, and one of the speakers, that's where my wife and I went to college. We went to Pensacola Christian College. And uh, their, their church is broadcast and everything. But one of the speakers, and I believe he's retired now, was Dr. Molinex. Uh, does anyone, does that sound familiar at all, Dr. Molinex? No? Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, well, Dr. Molinex was an incredibly, 
wise and, and just intelligent man when it came to the Bible. I mean, this guy, he, he knew his stuff. Uh, and he was one of my favorite teachers. And the reason being is because the, the things that he said were just so, they were, they were meat. It wasn't milk, it was meat. And it was one of those things where I appreciated that. I really loved that because sometimes we'd hear pastors that were just, you know, they, they would share the message and it'd be John 3, 16. And it was just very, you know, it was good, but it wasn't like super deep. Well, I really liked Dr. Mullinex a lot, but Dr. Mullinex was probably one of the least favorite pastor preachers that we had at the school. Uh, and the reason being was, man, was the guy boring. Whew. He was, he was monotone, didn't really inflect a whole lot. Like, it was just one of those things where he was, he was just, gave you the word and the truth about it, and that was it. Nothing showy about it. Uh, and I told Andrea this before. She was one of those people that just thought he was kind of boring. Um, and that, that's, that's fine. It wasn't people's preference, right? See, he wasn't very energetic. He wasn't very loud, and so some people didn't like that. Well, this isn't the same thing. Because some people would say, oh, it's going to be, you know, oh, man, I don't like them because they're, they're very energetic, very loud, showy, stuff like that. I don't like that person. This isn't what they're talking about here. When it's, when it's talking about itching ears, it's not referring to a specific style, a specific way that people are speaking. What the issue is, is that people were turning away from sound doctrine and turning toward whatever pleases themselves doctrinally. That's what people will turn to. They'll turn to whatever they want the word to say and turn away from God. See, I think you probably know this. Pastor Ed and I, we're very different, right? Does that make one of us wrong and one of us right? I hope not, right? Because I'm the right one, no. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we're very different, right? But we're both up here striving and pursuing to preach the word, the truth. That's our ultimate goal. Some of us may speak better. Some of us may be more fluent in our language, right? Some of us might spell better. If you, you can tell whenever I make my slides because there's some errors in there every once in a while. I think they're okay today. See, we all have our own strengths. But if we're up here proclaiming the truth and preaching the word, that is the goal. And as listeners, that needs to be your goal as well. That's what you need to be listening to and striving to hear is the truth and sound doctrine. So what these people will do is they will accumulate more teachers that say the things that they want to hear. They'll just surround themselves by, by people like that. So back in Paul's day, in, in ancient Greece, there were things called, a peop, an individual called a sophist. And what sophist was, in just a very basic definition, is they were a paid individual that could eloquently argue for an invalid idea. Uh, when we're talking about 2 Corinthians, I mentioned how the Greeks were very intellectual. That is something that they, they prize. They would just argue for argument's sake. They would just go back and forth for no reason other than just to sound smart. And that's what these sophists would do. What they were is they were these secular atheists that would use deity or use God or, or any kind of religion to really win a debate and to prove their own point. They would, they would maybe try to find ways that it contradicts and say, yes, yeah, see, see, we're right. And it really caused a lot of confusion with people. Many of these people were actually celebrities in their day. A lot of these people were celebrities. And, and, and as I was learning about this, I found it kind of interesting because I feel like celebrities nowadays kind of do the same thing. Like there'll be a commercial for, you know, the one thing that, that I see a lot is usually global warming. There'll be a commercial for global warming and they'll have like Leonardo DiCaprio up there talking about global warming. And then if you're, li you're listening, you're like, man, you know, he can really speak well and do all these things. And then you're like, what does he know about global warming, right? It's one of those things where you're like, wait, what? What is he doing, right? And so just because he can speak eloquently and provide those things, people will fall for it, right? But it's also something that people want to hear. It's a narrative. It's an idea that's very popular today. And so they get the celebrity that can speak it and, and communicate and argue it well without even knowing a whole lot about it. And they, 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 they form groups of masses of people what the sophist object or objective was was to bring people to the point of believing ro uh, sorry moral relativism. That's what their, their goal was. They wanted people just to think, you know, it doesn't really matter. What you think is wrong doesn't mean it's wrong for me. Or what you think is right doesn't mean it's right for me, right? It, it all depends on myself and my own beliefs. 
So these teachers would lure people into agreeing and believing with them just these fables, these myths. People would say, it sounds really cool and exciting, so maybe it's just worth following, right? And it doesn't upset me. What happens when you flood yourself with ideas that only you prefer, prefer, it will become harder and harder for the truth to drain those ideas out. You, 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 I, I'm sure you're familiar with that all over the news, right? Whatever news you listen to, there's always a narrative being pushed. And sometimes we might change the channel, right? It's not something that we want to hear. And so we'll change the channel. But the more that narrative becomes pushed, and it's everywhere, right? Everyone has cell phones, access to internet, TVs, all these things, and you just get flooded with information, and you really kind of have control of it. You can turn it off, you can change the channel, you can swipe to the next page, whatever it may be. You have control of it. And so, even more so than, than ever, I believe, we can flood our minds with ideas that we like, with things that we prefer. So we have many outlets saying the same thing, right? I, there's this video of this news station. It's news stations all over the country, and they say the exact same thing, but they made it sound like they just came up with it. It's, it's, it's actually kind of an interesting video. They say word for word the same exact thing, and it's completely different news stations all over the country. And it's like, hmm, yeah, they're not working together, or they're not trying to push a specific narrative. Like, this is from our heart. We're just speaking. It's not a prompter or anything right now. And it's something that's very interesting. And you see that, and, and a lot of times people will just get more and more information just surround themselves by it. One thing we have to be careful, though, is that just because there's a large following of something doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. And the best way I can really compare this is that just because there's a large church doesn't mean the pastor is a false teacher. Because a large church pastor can preach the word just as much as a small church pastor. And just because it's a smaller church doesn't mean the pastor is preaching the word. So we, 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 can't, we can't say numbers is what determines this. We can't do that. In verse 4, it reads, this, or we, we see that this accumulating of false ideas will lead to the complete rejection of the truth and acceptance of false ideas and just fables. Surround yourself so much that you're just like, eh, truth doesn't even bother me anymore. I don't, I don't even have to listen to it. So what must we do? What is our responsibility as we're entering into an age? And in this time, you know, it's not like there's going to be a day all of a sudden, oh, wait, okay, now people are just not going to listen to the truth. That's been going on in Timothy's day back then, right? So what do we do about it? Well, verse 5 tells us, as for, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We have to be sober-minded. We must show restraint and control of ourselves. We must be careful of what we are looking into. See, not everything on the internet is true. Shocker, right? <laughs> not everything on the internet is true, but everything on the internet will have thousands of people telling you why it is true. And that's where we have to show restraint. That's where we have to be careful because there's probably some very convincing arguments out there. And there's some theological beliefs that are being pushed, unfortunately, by my generation, that the arguments sound, sound. They sound very good and they're very convincing. And we have to be careful with that. We have to show restraint. We have to go to the words and not, honestly, not even rely on ourselves. We have to rely on the grace of God and, and, and stay focused on the truth. We cannot get drunk on the idea of the day. Next thing is we need to endure suffering. When we talked about suffering a few weeks ago, we know that this is the most vulnerable time for us falling away. So we need to protect ourselves, surround ourselves with the word and those that teach it. Especially if you're going through suffering. That's when the, that's when the enemy really wants to push on you these ideas. is because it's easier just to get out of it. So we need to endure through suffering. And we must continue in our sharing of the word and doing the job that God had given, has given us. See, once we take a break from sharing the word, once we take a break from doing our ministry, that's when our curiosity begins to peak. That's when we just take a break and we're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to see what everybody's kind of talking about. You know, we have to be careful with that. We have to be careful. We have to stay focused. 
So that's the first why. The first why is because people are just, they're not going to want to listen to truth, and they're going to surround themselves with people that think the same way and that communicate the same thing. The next reason is because the generations before and the previous generations are passing away. Starting in verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So the word for here is a continuation of a previous statement. See, Paul is telling Timothy, you need to be sober-minded, right? You need to endure suffering. You need to do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry because I am passing away. I am leaving. Paul knew he was on his last leg. Paul knew at the end of his life was coming. And he wasn't going to be around to preach the word anymore. So he told Timothy that he needed to carry on the work that Paul had started. What we can learn from this is that the work of God is always more important than the instrument that he uses. The work of God is always more important than the instrument he uses. And we see that all through Scripture. Right? We have Paul, and then to follow Paul, we have Timothy. You had Moses, right? And then to follow Moses is Joshua. Moses died. We had Elijah, and then Elisha was to follow. See, the work and the word of God continued on through generations even though the instrument had passed away. So Paul wants Timothy to know that the ministry of preaching the word does not end with Paul. It is to be carried on. The next generation must be ready to take up this charge and carry it until God sees their time has done. So Timothy, one thing we can look at, Timothy was already in ministry, right? He was already at the church. He was already doing the work. So he wasn't waiting for Paul to die. He wasn't standing there and be like, come on, Paul, man, I can't start my work yet because you're just, you know, you're in the way. You're always preaching and writing letters these days. No, right? He was already doing the work. And so this next generation needs to step up now. It's not a wait until it passes on. We need to step up now. And for the older generations, we need to, you need to be aware that you need to be handing it off. Right? Your ministry and your, your work is not done until you are dead. But once you're dead, what happens? What did you hand off? And so we need to be prepared for that, both now and, and older generations. What we see here is that Paul encourages T uh, Timothy with his own testimony of working and sharing the word. Starting in verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So Paul was not disappointed in the fact that he was going to die. He wasn't, you know, about to uh, enter his, his, his death thinking, having all these regrets. He knew that he fought the good fight. He was finishing well. See, he fought sin and temptation. My, my basketball team, we were watching a video not that long ago of the whole team. We were very good this year. Especially watching the videos, I'm like, oh man, we were way better than the other teams. And I was the coach. I wasn't a player. So if I was playing, we would not be as good. Um, but there was one game that was the hardest game we had all year. And it was a tough game. And after that game, and it was the semifinals before we went to the state championship game. After that game, you could tell on the guys that they were more excited about that game than any other game. And the reason being is because they fought hard. Man, they put all their energy in it. And that's what Paul is saying is he's fought hard. He's had, he's had temptation. He's had to deal with sin. He's had to deal with all these things, and he fought hard. And so at the end of his life, he knew, I gave it my all. And there's nothing to be disappointed in myself about that. I can be proud in that. He also finished the race. The calling in his life was, his, was this race to push through criticism and persecution and rejection. See, he would preach the word, and not everybody accepted it. But he finished, he pushed through those things. And he also kept the faith. Through all the things that was going on, this criticism, this persecution, he was focused on his goal, and he competed the way God wanted him to. So Paul was not disappointed in himself. He was not upset about this death. And so what Paul says is that he will now receive a crown. Christ will reward him this crown for his faithfulness in preaching the word. So you might be like, okay, Paul, cool, are you kind of bragging a little bit right now? You know, like, all right, wow, you finished strong, great. 
Well, I like at the end of the verse where it says right here, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. See, we can obtain the same prize. We can, we can view uh, some in this faith, but they are, they, oh, oh, I know what I'm saying there. So some people in the faith, right? So Paul or Peter or the other disciples, you may look at them as, as some uh, elevated person, right? Some, some particular person, special person. And yes, God used them in, in many great ways. But what we have to understand is that they were just human, right? In Catholicism, they elevate the human, certain individuals. But what we know is that they were just human. They struggled and dealt with the same things we did. So what we can do is we can fight the good fight. We can finish the race, and we can keep the faith, too. See, we have the same God, the same Jesus that Paul did. And Paul was over to, able to overcome these things because of God's grace and because of Jesus. And we can do the same thing. We can obtain this reward. And you, may, you may ask yourself, or you may say to me, well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what my life has been like. You don't know the things I've gone through. Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, Jesus isn't holding those sins against you, saying, well, you just shouldn't have done those sins in your past, so, you know, you can't obtain these things now. You may say to yourself, or you may say to one of us, that I can't do it because I'm too weak. I'm weak. Not only is my response to this, but God's response to that is good. Good, you're weak. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it reads, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's not about your own strength. It's about Jesus and what he can do through you. So the time is now for the next generation to listen to this charge and to finally listen to it as is meant to be directed to you and me. Not just given to Timothy, but given to all of us that are in here. So that's the why. That was the last question. Why this charge? But what we're going to see at the end of this chapter now is what happens in one's life when they live in obedience to this charge. What are some things that you may experience when you're preaching the word? The first one is that some will abandon you. Verse, starting in verse 9, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. So Demas is mentioned three times in the Bible. It's mentioned three different times. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, and there's, there's, I don't know who noticed this before. Uh, there's a lot of commentaries that, that talk about this. But he's mentioned three times, and you can kind of see different steps in, in Demas' faith. We don't know a whole lot about him and what, it, what his life was about. But the first, what we see is in Philemon uh, 23 to 24, we read, Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, uh, Aristocras, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So here he's mentioned as a fellow worker. Right? He's mentioned in a list of, of, of even some familiar names as a fellow worker. In Colossians 4, verse 14, we read, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. So there, it's just regular old Demas. Right? He's a fellow worker before, but now it's, oh yes, and Demas also greets you. But what we get here is that we see that Demas has deserted him because his love for the present world was greater than his love for God's world, for what God wants to do. See, what we think here is that Demas may not actually, may not have understood the true cost of discipleship. As he was experiencing rejection and, and, and following Paul and seeing these things, he may have said, I've given up too much. I can't stand, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And so his love for the present world caused him to depart and to abandon Paul. See, com some companions in life, when you're starting to preach the word, they might abandon you at some point. They may not hold the same views of, of, of what God has for you. They, they may not uh, know what the cost is of discipleship, and some may abandon you. But it's not all bad things that will necessarily happen to you. We also see here is that some relationships will, in fact, grow stronger. It says here that Luke alone is with me. Luke was with Paul from the beginning, pretty much. 
right? We read Acts, he wrote Acts, and he's with Paul there, and, and he's on all these missionary journeys. Their relationship has grown stronger and stronger to the point where Paul is getting, uh, reaching the point of death, and Luke is still with him through it. We also see that some relationships will be reconciled. In verse 11, it reads, get Mark, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Acts 15 tells us that Paul has, uh, was not happy with Mark. He was not very happy with him because Mark, what he did is that he uh, had abandoned Barnabas and Paul on one of their missionary journeys. And so he was, up with, he was upset with Mark. And at one point, uh, Barnabas and Paul were going on another journey, and Barnabas was like, hey, let's bring Mark. And they got into this argument about how Paul just didn't want Mark. He, he, he wasn't useful to him in the ministry. He was upset with Mark. Well, that rep relationship had been reconciled as both of them continued to preach the word. So even though he had felt deserted, there was reconciliation there, and that can happen when you preach the word. In verse 14 and 15, we also see that some will attack you. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did, did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. See, preaching the word will bring about those that oppose the word, those that oppose its message. We aren't sure exactly what Alexander did, but we must all be aware, for there will always be those that strongly oppose what God wants. We have to go with that understanding. We can't be, uh, we, we have to know the cost of discipleship, knowing that there will be those that, that oppose you, and not just say, I don't agree. That can actually do great harm. Some physically, some mentally, some can cause different things, maybe in your family, or cause issues with the government, but there will always be those that oppose you. And the last thing is you may feel alone. In verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, right? Paul felt alone, but he was even saying like, hey, I, I'm not saying these things to, to, to put shame and, and to judge those people, right? It may it not be held against them, but I am alone. I feel alone. But luckily, Paul doesn't end there, right? Imagine if that's where the book ended. It would be like, oh, man. Okay, I guess I got to push through that idea, right? In verse 17, it reads, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may feel alone, but you aren't. Jesus is there. Jesus is strengthening you. So now we get to the final greetings, the final portion of this book. And it, what, I'm gonna, what I get from this is something that I really like. I like portions of Scripture like this, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, uh, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Ebalus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens, and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. Sometimes you read portions of scripture like this and you're like, what am I supposed to get from that? All right? You're like, Paul's just greeting, you know, some of these friends and, and letting, uh, in a couple other verses, he's letting, you know, Timothy and, and whoever's going to come visit, hey, bring my coat, you know, bring some books that I left. What I love about portions of scripture is that this shows that Paul was a real person like you and me. Paul was a real person. He felt love, he felt anger felt loneliness. He felt uh, betrayal. See, he was not some godlike figure that had special abilities to follow God and that we just hope to maybe obtain someday. He was just like you and me. And that's a cool thing to me. And why is that important? Why do I think that that's so important? And the biggest reason is this. We can do this we can do all these things. We can guard the word. We can suffer for the word. We can continue in the word. And we can preach the word. This isn't something that, uh, uh, you know, some spiritual hierarchy can only obtain. We can do it ourselves, no matter who you are. And the reason being is this. It's not something that a normal human can do under their own strength. But we don't have to do it under our own strength. 
Verse 22, it says, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. If we're going to do this, and we can, we need to know that we have to, use, we have to be involved with Jesus. We have to use Jesus. We have to hold on to him. Hold on to who he is, his sacrifice, his life. And we also need his grace. We can't do it under our own strength. But that's, a, that's, that's relieving to me. Because I can use the creator of the universe's strength. And by his grace, we are able to do this. So we're not perfect. But by God's grace, we can still accomplish this great handoff. Let's pray. Father, you used Paul in a great way. You spoke through him, and and as he penned these words, these words that will last for generations, that will not pass away, God, you used him for that. Not only did you use him in in Timothy's life, but you have used him in our life as well. Father, help us to see that and know that we can be used in the same way. That we can be used to impact those around us. God, you have called every generation to guard the word, to suffer the word, to continue in the word, and to preach the word. Help us to hand it off to the next generation. Help us to not let it die with us. Father, I pray as we go through uh, living for the word and living for you in this great handoff, God, that we will trust in you, that we'll hold on to Jesus, our Savior, and that we'll also hold on to your grace because it is by that that we can do this. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're going to sing one more song uh, to close. So please stand, and we're going to sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. May you have a blessed week. Uh, and hold on to Jesus this week, all right? Live in his strength and his grace. God bless.